Hello and welcome rocketeers, moonwalkers and socially conscious space enthusiasts. The internet, like space, is always expanding. There is a lot of videos to watch, a lot of articles to skim through and a lot of Google images of Mark Ruffalo with a moustache to look at. But if you stay, uh, stay with us, we will give you the lowdown on all the news and current events related to space. So if you've ever looked up at the stars, considered how small you are in the vastness of the universe and wondered what's going on up there, then this is a show for you. I'm Sarah Crudus and this is Continuum, the live streaming show dedicated to space, the galaxy and everything related to it. It's a show that flat earthers will call fake news and we wear that badge proudly. So let's get started. This week on Continuum, we'll be doing a deep dive into errant space debris and humanity's responsibility towards the moon. Plus, we'll be taking a critical look at commercial spaceflight, which is becoming all the rage thanks to billionaires like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. And we'll be breaking out the abacuses to count the number of moons orbiting the asteroid Electra. And spoiler alert, it's going to be more than one, but less than 20. But before that, let's take a look at some of this week's breaking news. To begin with, Elon Musk recently delivered more than two dozen Starlink satellite internet terminals to Ukraine, which has been experiencing significant internet disruption since Russia invaded. The Ukrainian vice prime minister had initially reached out to Musk for help on Twitter. He later thanked the SpaceX CEO, saying, Starlink keeps our cities connected and emergency services saving lives. Now, speaking of Starlink, SpaceX launched 48 additional internet satellites into orbit on Wednesday. Just before takeoff, the launch director had a choice quote to share. Time to let the American broomstick fly and hear the sounds of freedom. LD is go for launch. Next up, this Russian Soyuz rocket at Baikonur Cosmodrome once proudly displayed badges of international cooperation. The flags of the US, UK, France, Japan and South Korea but sadly no longer, as these workers blank and whitewash them out. Russia's ongoing invasion in Ukraine and the sanctions plunging Russia deeper into international isolation is tearing apart the relations that just decades ago helped forge the International Space Station. See, Baikonur towers over the vast steeps of Central Asia in Kazakhstan and was once the centre of the Soviet Union's and Earth's first steps into the cosmos in the 1950s and 1960s. Even after the Soviet Union collapsed, Baikonur has remained the main launch site for Russia's space program and its guests. But now, as international sanctions pile on, those days are over. Even last week, OneWeb, a London-based company which was set, up to, set to launch 36 satellites from a Soyuz rocket, those satellites reached their Baikonur launch pad before Russia suspended the launch, demanding that OneWeb distance itself from the British government. OneWeb responded by leaving Baikonur, perhaps for good. Now, Russia's other international space collaborations are fraying just as fast. Erosita, a German-built black hole observatory riding a Russian satellite, has been switched off. And ExoMars, a joint ESA project that was set to deliver the Rosalind Franklin rover to Mars, faces indefinite delays. We will, of course, continue to monitor how the space industry is affected by the war in Ukraine. And it goes without saying that our thoughts are with those affected by the conflict. Now, moving on to a bit of lighter news. Need a kidney delivered from space? Well, maybe. How about a pizza? Well, in Virgin Space, a new startup has you covered. Perhaps. The co-founders were recently flamed on social media after they released details about their business model. The company aims to, believe it or not, store goods ranging from fast food to artificial organs in orbital cap capsules, which can then be summoned back to Earth on demand. Because... That's the far, what the fast food industry needs to take longer. So next time, don't worry, your Taco Bell order is only cold because it came from the vacuum of space. Now, despite criticism, the startup has already raised $10 million in seed money, so we'll just have to see where that one goes. And lastly, to Mars, China's rover Zorang, which has been on the surface of the Red Planet since May last year, just sent back possible evidence Oh, well, evidence of wind and possible water erosion on the red planet. Take a look and a listen as the wrong rolls along in this video compiled by YouTuber iGadget Pro. Thank <laughs> you. 
So when asked for a comment, the rovers are wrong replied, yeah, that's cool and everything, but did you know you can order a cheesy gordita crunch from space? That was a direct quote, by the way. And now let's talk about moons. One of the most beautiful things about the cosmos is the way that it organizes itself into systems. Stars, galaxies, planets, they all form these systems in their own cosmic neighborhoods. Even something as small as an asteroid can create a system under the right conditions. And scientists just found a really, really cool example. A team of researchers in Thailand recently discovered the first ever quadruple asteroid system, an asteroid with three moons. Although this does sound eerily similar to my million dollar movie pitch, Three Moons and a Baby. Now technically we've known about the primary asteroid Electra since the year 1873 and its two other moons since 2003 and 2014 respectively. But thanks to data gathered from the Very Large Telescope in Chile, we found a third. And sidebar, yes, that is the telescope's real name. And believe it or not, it gets even better. They have a telescope in development called, quote, the Extremely Large Telescope, which is just the best. Naming your telescope the Very Large Telescope belongs in the Procrastination Hall of Fame, like someone literally showed up on the day the telescope was to be named, had absolutely forgotten to do the assignment, took one look at the telescope, and then kind of gasping for words, gave the suggestion, the Very Large Telescope. Anyways, the Very Large Telescope's team, led by Anthony Burdu from the National Astronomical Research Institute of Thailand, created an algorithm that facilitated their discovery of the third moon orbiting tightly around Electra this year, and basically sent the whole system flying into the history books. So move over King Tut, out of my way the 1973 Chilean coup d'etat, an asteroid with not one, not two, but three moons is coming through. Now you may be thinking, she's off a rocker, an asteroid with moons. How can you have an asteroid with moons? Aren't moons just for planets? Well, scientifically speaking, the answer is no. There's still some disagreement among the community about what exactly a moon is, but the most basic definition states that a moon is any natural object orbiting a non-star. Some of them, like our moon, which I like to call the best moon, might orbit a planet, but that certainly doesn't mean that all moons have to. Now in this next clip from the Oxford University Press, David Rovery, a planetary scientist at the UK's Open University, an author of the very aptly named Moons, a very short introduction, details which objects can have moons. So let's take a look. All kinds of objects can have moons, not just planets. Dwarf planets like Pluto and other things out in the Kuiper Belt have moons. There are many asteroids that have moons. Some really tiny asteroids which whiz by the Earth have tinier moons of their own. There aren't any comets with moons, though some comets are two bits joined together, so they may have been orbiting each other once upon a time. And here's a fun fact to you. There's even a theory that moons themselves could have moons. So that's basically a moon for a moon. That's like giving a toddler a baby dog to play with. I mean, you can't take care of that thing because you are that thing. Now, this particular asteroid moon was discovered by accident. Badu says he was testing an algorithm meant to help block unwanted light in telescope data, taken from some of the moons of Jupiter in the year 2019. During that same night, Badu also took some data from Electra. When he ran it, he found more light than he expected. At first, he brushed it off as a fluke. It must have been a flaw in the telescope data. But as it would turn out, Badu and his team didn't need a better telescope. They just needed better software. Two years later, Badu re-examined the data with a new light-reducing algorithm that works kind of like scientific Photoshop. So basically, have an unwanted object covering up your picture, just crop it out. Have a celestial body that broke your heart that you'd rather forget about, I mean, erase him, dude. Erase him from that photo, move on, and get back out there. Now, within the astronomical community, this algorithm is making almost as big a splash as the moon itself because of how effective scientists think it will be in the future. It certainly works on Electra. The history-making moon popped up bright and clear on an angled orbit around its primary asteroid. And when Badu and his team went back through the three other older Electra data sets and applied the new algorithm, the moon showed up in the same place. That was enough to cement the finding and name Electra the first ever quadruple asteroid system discovered. Now, even though Electra has the most moons we've ever seen in an asteroid-centric system, it's probably not the limit. And even though the Daredevil spin-off Electra starring Jennifer Garner was a critical and commercial failure, it doesn't mean we won't get the well-deserved sequel. 
although I'm not sure it's that well deserved. Now, we've seen systems with moons orbiting non-planets that have more than four bodies. A great example is the Pluto system, which has six. So there's no reason to place a ceiling at four for asteroids. Who knows how many moons could be hiding in the light of asteroids just waiting to be uncovered. And that's one of the amazing things about space. We just don't know what else is out there. Now, coming up next, we'll talk about a piece of rocket that hit the moon late last week. But first, here's a few select tweets from Elon Musk, read out loud by a robot. The rumor that Bill Gates and I are lovers is completely untrue. When the zombie apocalypse happens, you'll be glad you brought a flamethrower. Works against hordes of the undead or your money back. The rumor that I'm secretly creating a zombie apocalypse to generate demand for flamethrowers is completely false. Short shorts coming soon to Tesla merch. Paired with thigh-high suck boots. The rumor that I'm building a spaceship to get back to my home planet Mars is totally untrue. Now moving on from talking about multiple moons to talking about a single moon, our moon. A piece of rocket recently slammed into the moon at roughly 9,000 kilometers per hour. The rocket in question has been identified as a Long March 3C, named after the military retreat which resulted in the emergence of Mao Zedong as the undisputed party leader of China. And as a quick aside, if we're naming rockets after historical events in an attempt at patriotism, here's what I think we should name the next American rocket. Joey Chestnut breaks world record by eating 76 hot dogs at Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest. I mean, you Americans, you really like to eat food and you really like to eat that food fast. This park is shouting Joey and Jeffrey Bezos, I'm only going to ask once, bring Joey to the moon with you, man. He's earned it. Chestnut is a true American treasure. Initially misidentified as a SpaceX Falcon 9, which is, a name, na which is named after a bird that Elon Musk thinks is, quote, dope, the rocket actually left Earth in 2014 as part of China's Chang'e 5T1 mission, and it's been tumbling in a chaotic orbit for over seven years. But let's face it, we've all been tumbling in a chaotic orbit since Gwyneth Paltrow and Chris Martin split up. But on March 4th, the Long March's Long March finally came to an end, and violently. The lead up to its impact has sparked a wide ranging debate about space junk, rocket decontamination procedures, and humanity's responsibility towards the moon. I mean, we may not be her real parents, but damn it, we're going to treat her like she's our own. Now, some corners of the space community are outraged, and others see the rocket as largely unimportant from an environmental perspective. But one thing has become clear. With crewed lunar missions once again on the horizon, we're going to have to start thinking a lot more carefully about moon debris, or as I like to call it, lunar litter. Now, this is far from the first time humans have crashed something into the moon. According to Alice Gorman, a space archaeologist, which is just an amazing job title, at Flinders University in Australia, it's actually business as usual. The first human-made moon crater was created by Russia's Luna 2 in the year 1959. Here's an old news clip updated, uploaded by the International Astronautical Federation, or IAF. <laughs> Soviet Russia scores a dramatic victory in the exploration of space with the launching of the first rocket to hit the moon. An historic scientific feat simulated in these scenes, which show the course of the multi-stage rocket carrying the 858-pound Lunik. Bearing the Soviet coat of arms and hammer and sickle pennants, it traveled 35 hours through space. It is the first man-made object to voyage from one cosmic body to another. Western observers monitored Lunik's two radios to the very moment of impact which occurred almost dead on target, the geographical center of the face of the moon. Impressive marksmanship at a quarter of a million miles range. In one spectacular, well-timed move, Russia scores a major scientific advance, dramatically demonstrates the accuracy and reliability of its missiles, and gives Khrushchev a propaganda bonus on the eve of his visit to America. Moscow shot for the moon and scored a bullseye. Just me or was music better back then? 
Anyway, unlike the runaway Chinese rocket, Luna 2's impact was very purposeful. The budding Soviet space program wanted to prove beyond any doubt that its flagship lunar probe had actually reached the intended destination. So it equipped Luna 2 with a radio and a series of three sulfur bombs, which I like to call... Uh, no, I'm not going there, actually. I'm going to be mature, and I'm not going to make a, folk jo a fart joke. So anyway, these stinky little stinkers were rigged to release a bright plume of gas upon impact, but in the end, they didn't really go off as planned. Only one burst while the probe was still in transit. But on September 14th, Luna 2's radio abruptly stopped transmitting as the probe slammed into the moon right on schedule. And humans have been putting our mark on the moon ever since. Debris from China's Chang of program, Japan's Hidden program, and pretty much every Apollo mission listed the lunar surface to this day. I mean, back in 1969, Buzz Aldrin left his lucky dice up there, and he hasn't had a day of luck since. David Rovey, who we heard from earlier, says that there's probably between 20 and 40 human-made craters on the moon. That's on top of the 200-plus natural craters speckling our side of the lunar surface. You know, they're natural, so enough with your unhealthy beauty standards for the moon. Because it has basically no atmosphere to protect it, the surface of the moon gets pummeled by space debris much more frequently than Earth's. Meteors that would get torched on the way to our planet's surface plow right into the moon's dusty soil. And as far as David Rothery is concerned, adding one more crater isn't a big deal. However, he is troubled by another possibility, biological contamination. The search for alien life is one of humanity's greatest and most delicate undertakings. For this reason, some scientists worry that a rocket carrying microbes from Earth could accidentally seed another planet or moon. These microbes would not only risk destroying possible native life, life forms, but could create a false positive for researchers taking soil samples later on. Now, fortunately, there's a protocol pre preventing false positives. The Committee on Space Research, or COSPAR if you're in a hurry, has a set of rigorous sterilization procedures for outgoing spacecraft designed to prevent biological contamination of celestial bodies. Unfortunately, though, not everyone follows them. So it turns out this isn't the first time the moon has been potentially contaminated with biological material. That distinction belongs to Israeli nonprofit Space Isles Bereshit 1 spacecraft, which crashed in 2019 with a payload full of tiny creatures known as tardigrades. I mean, that's horrifying, right? Can you actually picture it? Running around on the moon are a million little heimlichs from a bug's life. I am a cute little bumblebee! Tardigrades, also known as water bears, are microscopic and really, really hard to kill. They can survive extreme impacts, gamma radiation, and deep ocean pressure, with standing temperatures higher than 300 degrees or lower than 458 degrees Fahrenheit. And believe it or not, they can go at least 120 years without, without water. Plus, they're the only living things we know that can survive in the vacuum of space. And of course, they really want to be a beautiful butterfly. Look, I'm a beautiful butterfly! So the tardigrades are probably still kicking around up there. I mean, who knows? Maybe they've already set up their own moon base. Maybe they've started a society, elected a leader, fought a war, had a long trek that resulted in the emergence of Mao Zedong as the undisputed party leader. I mean, who knows? In the Long March rocket, if the Long March rocket had been a Falcon 9, biological contamination would have been a real, if remote, possibility, since as a private company, SpaceX isn't beholden to COSPAR. The China Academy of Launch Vehicle Technology, on the other hand, is a COSPAR partner, which means that their Long March 3 is about as sterile as a metal tube from Earth can get. So that's right, you heard it here first, folks. COSPAR rockets are clean and sterile, and Elon Musk rockets are dirty and nasty. Just kidding, Elon, but really, you should clean up your rocket or there's no supper for you. The wayward rocket impacted the moon's far side, but the good news is this could actually give scientists some useful data. That's because only a couple of other spacecraft have ever explored the moon's other face. This includes China's Yutu-2 rover. Data from Yutu-2 indicates that lunar soil in this region might be stickier compared with the Earth-facing side, and Gorman thinks that examining the Long March's crater could further support this theory. However, Rothy is less sure, but both he and Gorman are glad that the rocket has gotten the public talking about humanity's approach to lunar exploration. 
If people are going to return to the moon or possibly build something on it, we need to keep better track of space debris in order to ensure the safety of our future lunar communities. Now, let's just leave you with one final quote from Dr. Gorman. I think it's no longer good enough to say that the moon is dead or the moon has no environment and that we have no responsibilities towards it. You know, out of sight, out of mind isn't going to work for much longer. Now, moving on to private space flights. Are they reserved only for the wealthy or elite, or can society make outer space travel accessible for everyone? If you visit space flight company's Virgin Galactic website, a small purple box in the top right-hand corner reads, Fly With Us. It directs you to a web page to sign up for a commercial flight. However, even after signing up, a spot on these coveted flights is not guaranteed. And although undisclosed on the website, the price for one seat on a space flight starts at $450,000. I mean, for that price, you could fly from LAX to Newark, New Jersey over 2,000 times, which is 2,000 times more than you'd want to fly to Newark, New Jersey. Now, as billionaires and the rich venture into the realm of space exploration, it is becoming evident that the industry is currently reserved by the elite for the elite. Private space flights have become increasingly popular and frequent in the past year. The rapid commercialization of the space industry has led space companies to rely heavily on public relations stunts to create hype and normalize venturing out into, quote, the final frontier. Mary Jane Rubenstein, a professor of religion and science in society at Wellesden University in Connecticut, says that using phrases like the final frontier to describe space simply extends Western imperialism beyond Earth's orbit. Rubenstein, who also researches the histories of religion and science, especially in relation to cosmology and space travel, believes that this mindset creates a modern East India Company-style power dynamic for corporations like SpaceX and Blue Origin. She doesn't see increasing corporate interest in space as a great way of furthering democracy for anyone. That's basically how you get the moon renamed the Crypto.com Natural Satellite. Oh, and I hope you like Dunkin' Donuts, because on the moon there's now 50 of them. Virgin Galactic's Unity 22 mission, which took place on July 11th, 2021, served as a test flight for future passenger flights. On board was Sarita Bandler. With a quick Google search, Bandler is referred to as the, quote, Indian born flying into space and, quote, the Indian American astronaut. Blue Origin's NS-19 space flight, which launched on December 11, 2021, was the third human space flight for the company. It featured Laura Shepard, the daughter of the first American astronaut, Alan Shepard. Some would argue that their selection is an example of tokenism coming into play. Rubenstein argues that simply sending women and people of color into space does not make the enterprise inherently more democratic. Rather, it just paints a veneer of justice over an elitist venture. She says indigenous communities and people of color must be included in early conversations about space travel, how to make space travel ecologically friendly, and how to use it to improve the lives of our communities. When billionaire Jeff Bezos himself went into space, the crew included 18-year-old Oliver Damon, Blue Origin's first ever paying customer, who won his spot on the flight after the initial winner, who paid $28 million for the ticket, cancelled. Oliver Damon's ticket, which, by the way, was paid for by his father, was secured at auction. Now, can you imagine it? What else could you have come up that day? Like, what was more important than your $28 million flight to space? Did this guy have tickets for Batman? Now, despite the present financial inequality in space travel, Stephen Collicott, a professor of aeronautic and astronautics at Purdue University, says he's optimistic about the industry's future. Collicott, who has flown seven experiments on five Blue Origin New Shepard flights, points out that every mode of transportation, that is apart from walking, began with the rich before becoming accessible to all. When billionaires spend millions of dollars on a rocket, he argues that money goes right back into the economy, fostering growth. More recently, SpaceX launched a space flight on September 15th, 2021, on behalf of yet another billionaire, Jared Isaacman. Of the, four pe of the four person crew of the Inspiration 4 mission, none were professional astronauts. So it was basically like Armageddon, but less cool because there weren't even deep core drillers. 
Now, Isaacman, who has spent more than 6,000 hours piloting various aircrafts, was the commander of the flight. The successful three-day and first all-civilian spaceflight aimed to raise awareness and funds for St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. The mission raised more than $243 million for St. Jude, but Rubenstein sees an ulterior motive. She calls it trickle-down philanthropy. Quote, SpaceX said they are taking these flights for St. Jude's Hospital. Why not just give the money to St. Jude? Why do they have to go to outer space to do that, she says. Big companies like SpaceX use philanthropy as a reason for their space ventures. It helps make the entire concept more digestible for the public since it's for a seemingly good cause. It's literally like hitting some dude with your car and immediately buying 10 boxes of Girl Scout cookies for his daughter. I mean, I know I just hit you with my car and it looks really bad and everything, but you need to look at the big picture. What's that? You need to go to hospital. But did you see how many boxes of cookies I bought? 10. I bought 10 boxes of cookies. Rubenstein says that it's humanitarianism as an afterthought, something you can tag on to make the project look good. She says space is imagined as an empty space, no pun intended, to be mined and exploited, and that's troubling. And that's it. That's Charles Joe. Thank you so much for watching. You are now up to date with what's going on up in space. Why not impress your friends with some of your newly gained knowledge at your next dinner party? You can even use the same questionable jokes. Your friends will think you're kind of intelligent and kind of hilarious. So maybe thank me later. And please tune in to our next show in two weeks, streaming wherever you stream this one. That's One Giant Leap every other week. And follow us on Instagram at continuum.hq to keep up to date with all the cool stuff happening up in that big, beautiful cosmos that we're a part of. Thank you and see you soon.